Drew and I are pleased to welcome Kevin Warenda, who's the Director of Information Technology Services at the Hotchkiss School, a very prestigious and well-respected boarding school in the beautiful Northwest corner of Connecticut. Hello, Kevin. Hello, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you, you bet. Hey, tell us a little bit more about the Hotchkiss School and your role. Sure, the Hotchkiss School is an independent boarding school, grades nine through 12, as you said, uh, very prestigious uh, and in an absolutely beautiful location on the deepest freshwater lake in Connecticut. We have a 500, 500 acre main campus and a 200 acre farm down the street. My role is as the Director of Information Technology Services is essentially to oversee all of the technology that supports the school, operations, uh, academics, sports, everything we do on campus. Yeah, and you've had a very strong history in the educational field. You know, from that lens, what's, what's the unique you know, or if not unique, but the pressing security challenge that's top of mind for you? I think that uh, it's clear that educational institutions are a target these days, especially for ransomware. We have a lot of data uh, that can be used by threat actors and schools are often underfunded in the area of IT security, IT in general sometimes. Um, so I think threat actors often see us as easy targets or at least worthwhile um, to try to get into. Because specifically you're potentially spread thin, underfunded, you got, a, you got students, you got teachers. Um, so there really are some, are there any specific data privacy concerns as well around student privacy or regulations that you can speak to? Well, certainly uh, because of the fact that we're an independent boarding school, uh, we operate things like even a health center. Uh, so data privacy regulations across the board in terms of uh, just student data rights and FERPA. Uh, some of our students are under 18, so uh, data privacy uh, laws such as COPA apply, HIPAA can apply. We have PCI regulations with many of our financial transactions, whether it be fundraising uh, through alumni and development, or even just accepting the revenue uh, for tuition. So. It's, it's a unique place to be. Again, we operate very much like a college would, right? We have all the trappings of a, of a private college uh, in terms of all the operations we do. And that's what I love most about working in education is that it's, it's all the industries combined in many ways. Very cool. So let's talk about some of the defense strategies from a practitioner point of view. Then I want to bring in, in Drew to the conversation. So what are the the best practice and the right strategies from your standpoint of defending your, your data? Well, we take a defense in depth um, approach. So we layer multiple technologies on top of each other to make sure that uh, no single failure uh, is the key to getting beyond those defenses. Um, we also keep it simple. You know, I think there's some core things that uh, all organizations need to do these days, um, in, including you know, vulnerability scanning, patching, using multi-factor authentication, and having really excellent backups in case uh, something does happen. Drew, are you seeing any similar patterns across other industries or customers? I mean, I know we're talking about some uniqueness in the education market, but what, what, what can we learn from other adjacent industries? Yeah, I, you know, Kevin is spot on, and I love hearing what, uh, what he's doing. Going back to our prior conversation about zero trust, right? That defense in depth approach is beautifully aligned, right? With the zero trust approach, um, especially things like multi-factor authentication, always shocked at how few folks are applying that very, very simple technology and, and across the board, right? I mean, Kevin is referring to, you know, financial industry, healthcare industry, uh, even, you know, the um, security, and uh, police, right? They need to make sure that the data that they're keeping evidence, right? Is secure and immutable, right? Because that's evidence. Well, Kevin, paint a picture for us, if you would. So you uh, were primarily on-prem, looking at potentially, you know, using more cloud. Uh, you were a VMware shop, but tell us, paint a picture of your environment, kind of the applications that you support and, and the kind of, I want to get to the before and the after Wasabi, but start with kind of where you came from. 
Sure. Well, I came to the Hatchford School about seven years ago, and I had come most recently from public K-12 and municipal. Um, so again, not a lot of funding for IT in general, security, um, or infrastructure in general. So Nutanix uh, was actually a, solu a hyperconverged solution that I implemented at my previous position. So when I came to Hotchkiss and found mostly on-prem workloads, um, everything from the student information system to the card access uh, system that students would use, um, financial systems, they, they were almost all on-premise, but there were some new SaaS solutions coming in play. Um, we had also taken some time to do some business continuity planning, uh, you know, in the event uh, of some kind of issue. I don't think we were thinking about the pandemic at the time, but certainly it helped prepare us for that. So as different workloads were moved off to hosted or cloud-based, we didn't really need uh, as much of the on-premise compute and storage as, as we had. Um, and it was time to retire that cluster. And so I brought the experience I had with Nutanix with me and we consolidated all that into an, a hyper-converged uh, platform running Nutanix AHV, which allowed us to get rid of all the cost of the VMware uh, licensing as well. Um, and it is an easier uh, platform to manage, especially for small IT shops like ours. Yeah, AHV is the uh, Acropolis hy hypervisor. And so you migrated uh, off of uh, VMware, avoid uh, v the VTAX avoidance. Uh, that's a common theme among uh, Nutanix customers. And now, w w did you consider moving into AWS? You know, what was the catalyst to consider Wasabi as part of your defense strategy? We were looking at cloud storage options and they were just all so expensive, uh, especially in egress fees uh, to get data back out. Um, Wasabi came across our, our desks and it was such a low, low barrier to entry to sign up for a trial and get, you know, a uh, terabyte for a month. Uh, and then it was, you know, $6 a month <laughs> per terabyte after that. I said, we can try this out in a very low stakes way to see how this works for us. And there was a couple of things we were trying to solve at the time. It wasn't just a place to put backups, but we also needed a place to have um, some files that might serve uh, to some degree as a content delivery network. You know, some of our software applications that are deployed through our mobile device management needed a place that was accessible on, on the internet that uh, they could be stored as well. So we were testing it for a couple different um, scenarios uh, and it worked great. Uh, you know, performance wise, um, it's fast, uh, security wise, it has all the features of, of S3 compliance um, that works with, with Nutanix. Um, and anyone who's familiar with S3 permissions can apply them very easily. And then there was no egress fees. We can pull data down, put data up at will. Um, and it's not costing us any extra, which is excellent because especially in education, we need fixed costs. We need to know what we're going to spend over a year before we spend it and not be hit with, um, you know, bills for, for egress or, or because our workload or our, our data storage uh, footprint grew tremendously. Um, we need we need that. We, we can't have the variability that uh, the cloud providers um, would give us. So Kevin, you, you explained you're hypersensitive about security and privacy for obvious reasons that we discussed. W were you concerned about doing business with a company with a funny name? Uh, was it the trial that got you through that knothole? Uh, how did you address those, those concerns as an IT practitioner? Yeah, anytime we adopt anything, we go through a uh, risk review. Um, so we did our homework and you know, we checked uh, the funny name really means nothing. There's lots of companies <laughs> with funny names. <laughs> I think uh, we don't go based on the name necessarily, uh, but we did go based on the history, understanding you know, who started the company, where it came from, uh, and really looking into the technology and understanding that the value proposition, um, the ability to, to provide that lower cost is based specifically on the technology in which it lays down data. So, so having a legitimate, reasonable you know, excuse as to why it's cheap, uh, we weren't thinking, well, you know, you get what you pay for. It, it, it may be less expensive than alternatives, but it's, it's not cheap. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's reliable. Um, and that was really our concern. So we, we did our homework for sure um, before even starting the trial, but then the trial certainly confirmed uh, everything that we had learned. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Drew, explain the whole egress charge. We hear a lot about that. What do people need to know? First of all, it's not a funny name. It's a memorable name, Dave. <laughs> Just like the cube. Let's be very clear about that. Um, second of all, uh, egress charges. So, uh, you know, other storage providers charge you for every API call, right? Every get, every put, every list, everything, okay? Uh, it's, it's part of their, their, you know, their, their process. It's part of how they make money. It's part of how they cover the cost of all their other services. We don't do that. Um, and I think, you know, as, uh, as Kevin has pointed out, right, that's a huge differentiator because you're talking about a significant amount of money above and beyond what is the list price. In fact, I would tell you that uh, most of the other storage providers, hyperscalers, you know, their list price, first of all, is, is you know, far exceeding anything else in the industry, especially what we offer. And then, right, their, their additional costs, the egress costs, the API requests can be two, three, 400% more on top of what you're paying per terabyte. So you used a little coffee analogy earlier in our conversation. <laughs> yes. So I'm, I, here's what I'm imagining. Like I have a lot of stuff, right? And, and I, I, I had to clear out my bar and I put some stuff in storage, you know, right down the street and I pay them monthly. I can't imagine having to pay them to go get my stuff. That's kind of oh, the yeah. same thing here. Oh, um, that's a great metaphor, right? That, that storage locker, right? Yeah. You know, can you imagine every time you want to open the door to that storage locker and look inside having to pay a fee? No, no, right? that would be annoying. Or, um. or every time you pull into the yard and you want to put something in that storage locker, you have to pay an access fee to get to the yard. You have to pay a door opening fee, right? And then if you want to look and get an inventory of everything in there, you have to pay an, it's ridiculous. It's yeah. your data, it's your storage. It's your locker. You've already paid the annual fee probably because they gave you a discount on that. So why shouldn't you have unfettered access to your data? That's what Wasabi does. And I think as Kevin pointed out, right? That's what sets us completely apart from everybody else. Okay, good. That's helpful. It helps us understand how Wasabi is different. Um, Kevin, I'm always interested when I talk to practitioners like yourself in, in, in learning what you do, you know, outside of the technology, what are you doing in terms of educating your community and making them more cyber aware? Do you have training for students and faculty to learn about security and, and ransomware protection, for example? Yeah, cybersecurity awareness training is definitely uh, one of the required things everyone should be doing in their organizations. Uh, and we do have a program that we use and we try to make it fun and engaging too, right? This is, uh, this is often the checking the box kind of activity, insurance companies require it, um, but we want to make it something that people want to do and want to engage with. So even last year, I think um, we did one around the holidays uh, and kind of pointed out the kinds of scams they may expect in their personal life about you know, shipping of orders and time for the holidays and things like that. So it wasn't just about protecting our school data. It's about the fact that uh, you know, protecting their information um, is something you do in all aspects of your life, especially now that the folks are working hybrid, often working from home with equipment from the school the stakes are much higher um, and people have a lot of our data at home. Um, and so knowing how to protect that is important. And so we definitely run, run those programs in a way that, that we want to be engaging uh, and fun and memorable so that when they do encounter those things, especially email threats, they know how to handle them. So when you say fun, it's like you come up with an example that we can laugh at until of course we click on that bad link. Uh, but I'm sure you can, you can come up with a lot of, uh, interesting and engaging examples. Is that what you're talking about, about having fun? Yeah, I mean, sometimes they are uh, kind of choose your own adventure type stories. You know, they, <laughs> they, they, they stop as they run. So they're, they're, they're telling a story and they stop and you have to answer questions along the way to keep going. So you're not just watching a video, you're engaged with the story of the topic. Um, yeah, that's what I think is, is memorable about it, but it's also, that's what makes it fun. It's not, you're not just watching some talking head saying, you know, uh, to avoid shortened URLs or to check to make sure you know the sender of, of the email. 
Uh, you know, you're engaged in a real life scenario story that you're kind of following and making choices along the way and finding out was that the right choice to make uh, or maybe not. So that's where I think the learning comes in. Excellent. Okay, gentlemen, thanks so much. Appreciate your time. Kevin, Drew, awesome having you in theCUBE. My pleasure, thank you. Yeah, great to be here, thanks. Okay, in a moment, I'll give you some closing thoughts on the changing world of data protection and the evolution of cloud object storage. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in high-tech enterprise coverage.